the book of Peter. Here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin, contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Open your Bible and let's go to class with Dr. Murray for a better understanding of our Father's Word. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God for the privilege of allowing us to serve Him, that we can deal in His Word, teach His Word, and allow our Father to do the speaking through that Word. We just thank Him so much for that. In the precious name of Yeshua, may He send us a word of wisdom. Okay, discerning dreams. It's very important to you, beloved. In discerning dreams, by that, by that title, I mean being able to discern dreamers and prophets, so-called. Preachers, teachers, a pro the word prophet uh, basically means to teach. And God choosing teachers, many times the teacher of His Word, various gifts, and oftentimes to say to that teacher, as an example, Jeremiah was a teacher, Isaiah was a teacher, Daniel was a teacher, because they taught we that are, care about studying the Word of our Father and what teachers they were. So. We wanted to be able to discern whether or not God, first of all, would even speak to someone in their dreams or in a dream. Many times if God would speak to you and it's a dream, it's not like a dream you would have at night, though it's given in that sense that He shows you a thing where a so-called vision is needed and so forth. Is it a possibility? And we found yes, as it's written in one place, and many other places, but one place specifically, Acts chapter 2, that the sons and the daughters that God would use both men and women in the final generation to teach His Word, prophesy, teach, dream dreams and visions, the old men would. Uh, old men usually is supposed to signify those with wisdom would be spoken to by our Father through dreams and visions, letting them know when, where, why, and what they were to do. And He will. That's, that's uh, documenting the fact that it is possible even at this moment, hour, day, or and always has been. But God puts just, or probably more Scripture or warning to warn you of false teachers, false dreamers, false prophets, and the fact that it was very important that you be alert. And in that uh, 23rd chapter of Jeremiah, he made it real easy for you. I mean, it could not be made any easier. He said, 
if someone prophesies, basically it will align with this word or it will be my word. He said, if you hear a dreamer, then let him do what he wants, but you teach my word. I believe, and I can only speak from experience, if Father speaks to a teacher, it's usually nothing he can repeat anyway. It's an instruction that he is to do, and he usually doesn't blab about it. Doesn't play one-upmanship, as many do. And, and I don't and do this to criticize anyone, but it's a very serious subject. And not only will a man stand judged by Almighty God for having played church of saying, God told me this or God told me that, is in this day and time where millions can hear that voice, for example, let's say on television, that one individual must stand responsible for all the deceived ones that heard that voice, and that could be a lot. It's quite a responsibility to those that would use the so-called miracle in a way. As, as a matter of fact, Christ said, greater miracles than these shall even ye do. Meaning, look at this large audience. One time even he had to go out on a boat to get away from the, the press of the people to teach. And now we go into millions and millions of homes. It's an awesome responsibility when you set yourself, if you set yourself, the um, naturally the true statement, God sets a teacher up, man doesn't, all right? But if you set yourself up, the responsibility that you will answer for is awesome. So God gave many warnings in his scripture, both the old and the new. And I'm going to begin this particular uh, session in Matthew 24, where the seven seals, basically, and the seven trumpets are discussed in the seven events that Christ spoke of that would, would um, happen just before and during the time that he would return to this earth for his own. Within this, we have what the church, God's elect, are supposed to be doing, which is to say the true church that teaches God's word. They are still here as God's elect. They will be saved, but there will be few that will not be deceived because they will not listen to God's word. They would rather listen to those so-called dreamers that we have heard so much of. Okay, with a word of wisdom from our Father, let's get into it. What did Christ warn us of? Verse 4 of the 24th chapter of Matthew. And Jesus answered when he was asked how, what events would consummate the end of this age and his gathering back to us. Would it be a rapture? Would they fly away? How would it be? Jesus answered them, and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. That means those dreamers, those false prophets, those false churches. Be real careful concerning my gathering back to you and you to me. For men will deceive you. Now let's go on to verse 5 and find out what kind of men it would be that would be deceiving. Will it be Lucifer? Will it be uh, alcoholics? Will it be bank robbers? Who's going to be deceiving the people? Verse 5, for many, not just one or a few, but many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What does that mean? It means there's many I'm going to say, I'm a Christian preacher. I come in the name of Jesus, and I talk to him every day, and if you listen to me, you're, there's no way you can fall astray because he, he, he has coffee with me every morning, and we toast our toast together, and, and, and we just have a great old time. You know? now, now, naturally, that's ludicrous the way I'm putting that, but that's the way some of them sound, beloved. 
with their one-on-one upmanship of trying to play God touches me the most to the other evangelist and preachers and teachers. I'll include all just in case a few of the evangelists that are seem to be so apt and flippant to throw in. I talked to God today and he told me to drive my Jag instead of my Mercedes today. <laughs> yes, play, praise God. Uh, whatever, you know, God doesn't tell you whether to drive your Jaguar or your Mercedes. Uh, most of the time, he figures uh, most of them are just poor old teachers like me that have to drive a Ford anyway, so that you got enough sense whether to drive the Ford or the pickup. And anyone that's got sense, if you got to haul something, take the pickup, and if, if you're going to be on uh, to a funeral, take the car. All right, you know, usually a man can figure out simple things like that. God doesn't have to instruct. But they come in the name of Jesus saying, I'm a man of God. And they're going to deceive people. He didn't say some bank robber is going to deceive anybody. He said, those that come in my name are going to deceive many. And there are going to be many of them. And there are. Satan enjoys working from a pulpit. He can get a lot more done because usually someone is trying to tune themselves spiritually when they listen to someone that claims to be of Christ or representing him, a Christian. He said, that's the ones you want to be careful of because they'll deceive you. And Quite frankly, as he continues on in this 24th chapter, and it's a different subject for a different time, the seven events that are the seven seals. If you understand this 24th chapter of Matthew, you know what the seven seals are. You know how they come to pass. You know what's going to happen just before Christ returns. And you don't have to listen to some man. It's spoken right here by the Lord Jesus Christ on the Mount of Olives, on the same mount that he will return to, and will split it asunder with a way for his children. And if you understand this chapter, certainly it will lead you. You won't be deceived. Let's scoot on down, if we may, to the 21st verse in this, for the sake of time, in this 24th chapter. And let's continue this deception of dreamers and so forth and how you are to discern between them. Verse 21 of the 24th chapter of Matthew. For, they shall, their shall, for then shall great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall be. This is when the false Messiah appears. This is not the tribulation of God himself. This is that tribulation that the church will be exposed to which is the, the second tribulation is the tribulation of Almighty God, which is what most people call the great tribulation. Well, if you're, if you're a true Christian, you don't have to worry about God's tribulation. It's not going to harm you anyway because you are wheat rather than chaff, as we discussed in the last lecture. But this tribulation is going to be Satan himself with his rapture clothes on come to fly everybody away and most people are taught to fly with him. It's real sad. That's what tribulation, the, this pain or the sorrow, as, as it is used in uh, the 13th chapter of Mark concerning the same thing, are labor pains. Because those pains are getting so close together. The dilation has taken place and the birth of a new age is almost on us. Verse 22. God speaking. Where are you going to be? Listen carefully. And except those days should be shortened. That's to say, the days of that reign. You know from Revelation chapter 9 that it was shortened to a five-month period. Taught by man? No, by Almighty God. He tells you how much he shortened it to. From three and a half years to a simple five months. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. That's how impressive instead of Jesus is. 
but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Why? Because the elect, God's true church, will still be here. And hey, we can handle five months with God with us, with the Holy Spirit with us, doing as we are instructed to do in this very uh, chapter of God's Word, including Mark 13. For the elect's sake. Well, my preacher told me that the elect would be flowing away by this time when this tribulation came. Well, he lied to you, friend. Probably innocent because he probably didn't know what he was talking about because he probably listened to the church system rather than the Word of God. It makes it very clear if anyone had any doubt that God's elect would be here. Well, some say that this is the people of Jerusalem that didn't believe on Jesus. That's not what, they're not God's elect. They're not even, they, they are in a very, anyone that doesn't accept Christ is just kind of out of the fold right now. Does that mean, but they're still God's children. You've got people all around this world that do not accept Christ. God is talking about His elect in Christ, the many-membered body. For their sake, He shortened the days to five months, and they are to accomplish the things that are written in this chapter concerning being delivered up and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you as was recorded in the last lecture in Acts chapter 2 concerning that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet, that everyone would hear the true Holy Spirit speak through this short reign. Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, not God, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. What is, this really gets complicated, doesn't it? What is Jesus saying the deception will be about that you need to be able to discern? They're going to tell you that Christ is on this earth. After all, that is the subject of this chapter as asked by the disciples in verse 3, when are you coming back and what's going to be happening on the earth at the time you come back for us? Can you read? Read verse 3 of this same chapter. That's what the subject is. Christ is telling you in this 23rd verse, there's going to be a false Christ on earth before I return. And many are going to be deceived by him because they've listened to the deceived so-called Christian teachers. He said, if they tell you, as long as you're in the flesh body, if they tell you Christ in the desert here or there, don't believe it. Don't be, can you discern that? That's real simple. As long as you're in the flesh body and you can pinch yourself, the true Christ hasn't returned because the instant he does at the seventh trump, we're all changed into our spiritual bodies in the first place. So don't let some clown, even if he calls himself the head preacher of the great southern, northern, eastern, western gathering of the church of the living God, it's not from our Father if He's preaching something like that. We're all going to be gone. Don't listen to Him. He's a deceiver because God's church will be doing God's work right up until we have the victory over Satan. Believe them not when they tell you he's come to fly you away. Verse 24, for there shall, now did Jesus say maybe? Did Jesus say is, there is a small possibility? Or did he even say there is a great possibility? No, he said there shall. Arise, false Christ, and false prophets, false dreamers, and shall show great signs and wonders. And beloved, this means even supernatural, because the supernatural head 
of demonics will even be here wearing the robes of a priest, uh, saying, I am Jesus. Insomuch that if it were possible, listen carefully, if it were possible, these gifts of wonder making and miracles are so great, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's you. That's you that know his word. If it were possible, well, I got news for you, it's not. Because if, it, if you did, it would be the unforgivable sin. And I do not believe that one of God's elect shall ever commit the unforgivable sin. That is, as it is written in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, to refuse when you're delivered up before this synagogue to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. You could deny Christ, but you cannot deny the Holy Spirit to speak through you if you know better. If you don't know any better, hey, you, you got no problem anyway. You got no gift either. You got no blessing if you don't know better. For you've had God's word to study, to reap from, and how precious it is. I want to go to the books of Psalms. I want to go to Psalms 5. I want to talk about discernment a little more. Christ, the reason he warns you to be able to discern dreams and vision, which is to say teachings of God's word and dreamers claiming to have heard from God. People claiming to come in Christ's name, as it's stated in Matthew, are the ones that are going to deceive you if you allow it. What is your vanguard? What is your safety? God's word. Not this man's word or any other man's word, but the word of the living God. Okay, Psalms 5, I want to just read the whole psalm to you. Maybe I won't make a great deal of comment. Let God's word speak. Give ear to my words, not man's, beloved. My words, God says. O Lord, consider my meditations. Two, hearken unto the voice of my cry, O King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. You're the one I'm talking to, not some whittled off fence post out here with a face uh, carved into it. Verse 3, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. I mean, I'm going to wait. Do you talk to him, beloved? Oh, he loves to hear from you when you open your love up to him and say, I, Father, oh, Father, I love you. Oh, it touches his heart. Boy, you know, I, I'm going to just use a little analogy. When as a, you know, my little granddaughter come up and say, Oh, Papa, I love you. I hate, she wants a, a lollipop, she's going to get it. You know, I mean, if Papa's got anything, if it was the keys to my car, I'd, I wouldn't get it, but she's a little young for that. But when you tell your father you love him, his heart just melts to give you something. His blessings. Don't you understand? Verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. And it won't. God is fair and just. And if somebody starts telling falsehoods or claiming to be something they are not, that's wicked. It is the most wicked thing in the world and one of the greatest sins that can be committed is to mislead people the, uh, as a theologian into losing their soul or misplacing it for a little bit. I'm going to put it that way because they're not going to lose it. Verse 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And the greatest sin in the world. We've had a few preachers that have fallen from grace because of, of flesh sin. There's a greater sin. There is a greater sin that goes on every day than a sin like that. The robbing of souls by saying God said this or God said that. 
Will they be defrocked for that? Oh, no. Verse 6. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. Yeah, they'll be defrocked for that, but not by their church, by the hand of God. They were never frocked in the first place as far as he's concerned. All right. Verse 6, thou shalt destroy from, uh, thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. Do you know what leasing is? It's an old Anglo-Saxon word that means um, to uh, a lie or a deceiving, to be deceived. Leasing. God's going to stop it. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man, one that will murder souls for a simple cheap trip of saying, God talked to me today and he told me, child, you are to go here or to go there and God didn't say it. And maybe the child or the person, the believer, uh, would get in trouble or listen to a nut and get their shell cracked. And then you got two nuts. That's the way falsehoods go. You end up with nothing but a bunch of nuts everywhere. Verse 7. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. What is the holy temple? It's Christ. Revelation 21, verses 20 through 24. Christ is the temple. Do you pray in him or do you listen to man? Do you listen to this man speaking now without checking him out in the word of God? Then you are, in, you are at fault. You should check every man out and listen to God, not man. Verse 8, lead me, O Lord, not some nut. Don't allow some nut calling himself sent by Christ to lead you. Let the Lord lead you in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. So that you can understand, of course, but what is the way? Again, the way is Christ also. For there is no faithfulness or trustworthiness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. It's cunning. Their throat is an open supplica. Do you know what an open supplica is? It's an open grave ready for you to slide your little old body into it. They flatter with their tongue. Do you understand that? When, when some person comes up telling you, you are the most intelligent person in the world because you believe this great man of God that has dreams and visions that I share with you, you're very wise because you believe. Believe what? Believe God's word or that man's word? And they will flatter most people and they just, oh dear goodness. He's a good judge of character because he could tell I'm really something on a stick. You know? Satan's main, his MO, method of operation, is flattery. And flattery with most people will get you a long way. But when Satan comes up flattering you, you'd better be careful, my friend. You're playing with your soul. Verse 10, destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. By their own fancifulness of their mind, let them fall. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. Any time that you have a one-verse Charlie that teaches his word more than the word of God, doesn't that tell you what kind of person he is? And I know I'm, I'm being a little hard, be that as it may. There are many gifts given by God, whether it be counselings or positive thinking of telling you how to be happier and so forth. I'm speaking of teachers now. There's only one way a teacher of God's Word can teach God's Word, and that's to do it in His Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, allowing God to do the talking rather than the man. It shouldn't take a very 
uh, sharp person to figure that much out. That's the first start to the building blocks of knowledge, is to learn rather to listen to God than man. 11, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice, and you can, beloved, because that's the beginning of knowledge. Let them even shout for joy. Oh, it is a joy, the knowledge of God, because thou defendest them. And when God defends you and blesses you, you are prosperous and, and um, in good standing wherever you go, and a blessing even to the people. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee, and God certainly does. 12, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteousness with favor. Wilt thou compass him? Do you know what being compassed means? Surrounded. With favor. Do you know what it's like to have God's favored and compassed you? That's blessings from every direction and with a shield. Do you know what that shield is? Are you not familiar with the gospel armor of the sixth chapter of Ephesians? That shield is faith, and faith is simply to know that the living God and His Son, the Savior, that serving them is not a religion. It's not a building. It's a reality in everyday life. Are you happy? You can be happy in Him. Do you understand the book of Ecclesiastes that tells God's tender, slow, easy, down-to-earth way of telling you how to be happy even in this flesh body, even in this age? Have you read it? Have you, if you can't, Handle the languages? Have you been taught it by a, a teacher and considered and checked him out? Then that's where the joy from God comes from, even today. That was his personal signature, the book of Ecclesiastes. He sent you to this earth to live in the flesh, that is to say, your soul came from him into this flesh body. The book of Ecclesiastes is written by the wisest of all, said Jesus is Solomon, and it instructs you totally, completely, and perfectly how to be happy in this chunk of meat, this flesh body, and I think it is beautiful. Okay, I'm going to tell you what, right at the end of this Psalms, there's a little old book called Proverbs. How, how wonderful the Proverbs are. I want, I want to read, and then following Proverbs would be that great book of Ecclesiastes I was telling you about. I want to go to the 17th Proverb. This will be, the Proverbs, one of the reasons I don't teach in them any more than I do, they're so simple, anyone can understand them, and they're so, they are so beautiful. The 18th, I'm sorry, the 17th Proverbs, I want to read with verse 1, and I'm just going to read along here about 17 verses if we have time and just let them flow. Very little comment. Verse 17, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than an house full of sacrifices with strife. You got any strife in this house that you suppose, means to sacrifices is where you go to give your love to God. If there's strife there, you got trouble. It's better to be poor and have peace than to be, verse 2, a wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame, and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. A wiser servant is better than a son. Are you a wise servant of God? The finding pot is for silver and the furnace of for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. In other words, precious things are smelted by the fire of the furnace, but it is God that refineth hearts, which is to say minds. Refines them in what way? Plants them, cultivates them, and takes a mind that is stupid even and gives it wisdom 
if it will be wise enough to know from where wisdom flows, their own father. Our father can do anything, and I am so surprised that more people do not take pride in that fact, that our father is the best father there has ever been. And with his love that they won't turn to him, it is so foolish. Verse 4, a wicked doer giveth heed to false lips. A wicked doer will listen to a liar, and a liar giveth ear to a naughty tongue. Deceit. Whoso mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker, and he that is glad at calamities, that's to say that he gloats at the calamity of someone, shall not be unpunished. <laughs> Our Father knows. Be careful, my friends, especially if it is one of his little humble ones, poor ones, meaning humble before God, that is being embarrassed or something, don't gloat, friend. For the ice slope that you're about to slip on is already in view if you should gloat over one of God's little ones. Calamity. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers, their parents, our father. That's why I say, state, Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. A gift is as a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Has God given you a gift? It's the most valuable thing in the world, if he has. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. If God gives you a gift and you operate it in the way that he has instructed you in his word, you cannot go wrong, my friend. Verse 9, he that covereth a transgression seeketh love. In other words, a transgression means somebody messed up a little bit. If you, if you, if you cover that transgression, that means to help cover it up, to help bring about forgiveness for it, to help the person. Um, let's continue the parable. But, the, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. In other words, you get a blabber mouth that gossips the uh, transgression over the whole community. It can destroy friends. But peacemakers help cover the transgression. A reproof entereth more into a wise man than an hundred stripes into a fool. In other words, a wise man, you can reprove him and show him why whatever it is is wrong, and he will pay, take heed and that will fix it. But you can beat a fool to death and he'll never learn any better. Verse 11, an evil man seeketh only rebellion, therefore a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. That's one of the points I wanted to make in this. There's an evil messenger, a cruel messenger coming, all right. Are you ready for him? A cruel angel. That's what a messenger is. He's going to be claiming to be Jesus, but he's a liar. Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. In other words, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a mama bear that's upset about her cubs. But it's easier to face her than it is a, a, a fool in his folly. Oh, my. Get you killed. Verse 13. Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. You can't, those that are rewarded for being bad, don't let the good think they'll get away with it. They won't. The beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. You can control things. Listen to the proverb 15. He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abominable in the Lord. And how precious it is. Okay. 
I want to go from that proverb uh, to, I'm going to go to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. We're just about to wind this up here. Discernment is a beautiful thing, beloved, and it is critical. It is far more important than one might think because when you fail to practice discernment, you are dealing with those things that are of the soul and your soul can be hurt in deception. Why? How would you like to wake up sometime to know you had worshipped a beautiful Savior, thinking, had listened to people saying, this is Jesus, and you worshipped him and then find out it's Satan? How could you face your father? Because he warned you about it from coming out the gate. Okay, chapter 5, the book of Ephesians, verse 6. Let's go with it. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Can you discern? Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. It is the thing that angers God most. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Come out of lyings. For ye were sometimes darkness. One time you were blind, God saying. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He said, one time you were blind. And I wouldn't have thought that much about it. But God says, now you know the truth. Come out of them. Come away from them. Walk with me, my word, my truth. Don't listen to those people. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Can, do you know how to test the fruit? That's what he's saying to you. Are you wise enough to test the fruit and always test the fruit of a man also? I mean, you know, it doesn't take too much. Christ gave that very simple. If you walk up to an orange tree and reach up and pull an apple off of it, no, be wise enough to know there is something unnatural about this. Well, it's the same way with teachers. Verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. How do I do that? Through his word. 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, expose it. Then you'll be blessed by God. Well, wouldn't that make me unpopular? Not with God, and that's who really counts. I don't care what. I, I, I please God, and I hope that it please man. If it doesn't, hey, I, I, don't, I don't tremble about it because I would far rather please my Father than I would people. I hope it does, but someone that does not walk in the way, I assure you, they are offended easily. Verse 12, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You know, well, it would be, it would not be at all proper decorum. But I will say this, if you really knew sometimes, if you really knew, oh, I'm, I, we'll just go on. I, you know, I come almost, after the first year on television, leaving television. Not because we weren't successful on it, but because of the knowledge I learned of things that go on in the so-called business. Uh, enough, enough said. No, I, won't, I won't go in past that. Thirteen. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Truth will lighten its own way. All right? And... Um, Verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Do you want to know the truth? Where do you get it? The word of Christ. He is the living word. This is the word. Stay in it. 15, See then that you walk uh, circumspectly, that's to say carefully, not as fools, but as wise. Be wise, and all wisdom comes from God's word. 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
Make good time of it, for time is short and the days are evil. 17, to complete this place. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The reason I came here. Do you know what the will of God is? It is God's plan. You could only learn from one place, God's Word. Not listening to this man or any other man without checking them out to know whether what does the Lord really say. In closing, I have one other place I want to go. I want to go to the book of Romans. I want to go to the very last chapter in Romans 16, wouldn't that be? And we're going to complete and conclude this message on discernment. I hope that it has helped you to be able to use God's Word to discern those that say, I talked to God today, or I had this dream, or I dreamed this dream, as to whether it is truly from God. Chapter 16 in the book of Romans, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Don't be a simpleton. Don't be deceived by them. For your obedience is come abroad upon all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. All right? And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Did you hear me? Your feet, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You will have a part in bruising Satan under Christ's feet because you are a part of the many-membered body and you are a part of those feet. Walk with the body. Check man out. Listen to God's word and expose men that teach untruth. Bless your hearts. You listen a moment. Won't you put the book of Psalms, one of the longest book in the Old Testament, but a book that has a great deal to say about your life today. God's emotions, his feelings, a book that even tells you the food of the angels, how that our people, our forefathers, partook of that manna, that food of the angels that fell from heaven. How that he feels about you on a personal one-on-one -on -one level. You will never find a greater book in our Father's Word for encouragement and to assure you that our Father is in control. He has a wonderful way of teaching within this book by stopping, by having you relax a moment, by think, to think about what has just been said, and then he connects it for you with Sira that paused to stop, meditate, think. Our Father is so precious in his method of teaching. When it is taught at the hand of a teacher, the book of Psalms refreshes. The book of Psalms, uh, which gives you Christ's words on the cross, that's right, the actual words, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatene, his words as he was on the cross, quoting the 22nd Psalm, whereby you could know that he was Yeshua, he was Messiah. And that 23rd Psalm, so very beautiful, that speaks of eternal life, not the death Psalm as most people teach it, but eternal life. He even teaches you a little bit about the Hebrew alphabet in Psalms 119, teaching you through an acrostic type song some of the deeper truths. The 10 words used in that particular chapter is rewarding, is a blessing when you take a moment to study your Father's Word. The book of Psalms, I know you'll enjoy them. I know they'll be a great help to you. All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. Well, I hope I wasn't talking when we came on that time. It was, it was really good. John and I were having quite a conversation. Okay, I'm going to show you an 800 number. 1-800-643-4645. And that number good from Puerto Rico all the way up to all the United States uh, and our great neighbors to the north, Canada. And if you wish to make your own uh, toll call, area code 501 787 6026. 
Those of you that listen by shortwave around this globe, hey, you know what? We're going to show you an, an address. Your announcer will give it to you, rather, at the end of the program. It's so good to be able to circle the globe with God's Word, not the Word of man. We thank Him for that. If you have a prayer request, go straight to Him. Father, we know You hear us, Father. And we repent, Father, of our shortcomings. And we ask that You lead, guide, bless, prosper, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, let's get right into our see what questions, see what's going on around the country here. Jerry from Florida, Genesis 48.3. Jacob used the name El Shaddai instead of another name of God. Why? Well, um, you're coming into the prophecies that would tell what the tribes would do in the end times here very soon. And El Shaddai is a very special word in Hebrew. It would, I have a work titled The Nature of God, El Shaddai. It's a title. It is Yahweh and it is his title, but it goes into such detail of the very thoughts and nature of God, the name itself, in the Hebrew. Um, and that's why he used it. it. If I were to say any one strong point and one of hundreds that are in the name would be comforter, the comforter we have. But it tells you even how it comforts, even as a mother does a little nursing baby as she holds it to her. Vanita from California, when, when, when you smoke, does God punish you? No, you punish yourself. Okay, you're, you're, doing, you're doing a good job of it to yourself when you do, okay? Yvonne from Indiana. I mean, it doesn't please him by any means. What is the best method <clears throat> a Sunday school teacher can use to change the ideas of 10-year-olds have about the Bible. For example, Eve eating an apple. Well, I found, you know, we have many set five, four, six, eight, 10-year-olds, teenagers that study with us. And I know many adults, because of what they have been steeped in in the churches, think that I speak way above the young people's head. And that's not true. The young people ask very intelligent questions that have studied with us. Why? They were not so-called um, shepherded into false teachings. And when they hear the true Word of God read and expounded upon, and the teacher at the same time teaching them how to acquire tools that they can break it back to the original language themselves and study, they become very wise at a very young age, for all wisdom comes from God. I would suggest that um, you teach it on their level, but always exactly as it is. We have some very intelligent children in this generation. With no more information than that, I cannot advise you because I don't know what kind of Sunday school you're talking about if you, if you know where I'm coming from. Kenny from Pennsylvania. My wife and I believe in UFOs. Someone told us that since we believe this way, it makes us New Agers. I don't think this is true. Where can I document UFOs in the Bible? Well, they're, they're throughout the Bible. Not, they're not. UFO means unidentified flying objects. Well, they're not unidentified to our Father. He knows very well what they were. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 1, it explains very clearly that God himself came in a circular, highly polished bronze vehicle. And I know some people freak out when I say that, but hey, take a Strong's Concordance and break the word in verse uh, somewhere between 4 and 6, amber, the color of the circular object, and break that back to Hebrew in the Hebrew dictionary, and you'll find it's highly polished bronze. No big deal. I have a tape titled, Horses of the Bible that speaks of flying vehicles, okay, and researches the thing throughout the Word of God. I know perhaps the title of it throws some people, but many times horses of the Bible, you'll find out that they were, and the tape documents. So, 
I, I don't want to freak anybody out, and I just teach God's Word as it is with common sense. The tape titled Horses of the Bible. Okay, Bruce from Pennsylvania. Would God bless me if I re-sign with the National Guard for another nine years to make a total of 20 years? Well, it's good to have you watching there on Channel 61. Sure you would. I've always been a great one of protecting this nation and standing up for her rights. And, and uh, sure God would bless you. He's, he blesses this nation and he's going to bless the troops and always have that keep her uh, safe whereby a Christian organization can have the right to broadcast all the way around this world. And you're one of the ones, Bruce, that keeps it possible. So sure he would. Grant from Wyoming. What types of meat are not fit to eat? Please document. Well, that's a long, long subject. I have a tape. I know it sounds like I'm pushing tapes today, but hey, it's my work on that subject. And, um, and we only charge, what is it, $4 a piece for our tape. So sure, that's, uh, that's about what the equipment and everything it takes to duplicate them and everything and the postage. Uh, but Health God's Way will help you with that. But it's all documented in Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 11. You'll find it all written right there. If you need help with it, order the tape, God's Health God's Way. Helen from Louisiana. If someone, and, and I might add too, Grant, uh, doc, um, uh, Doctor's Corner, catch it the next time it's playing, and, and um, the good doctor will give you some advice uh, from an expert in that field, okay? Helen from Louisiana. If someone is a Kenite, can this person still order evil out of his or her life? Sure they can. If they have Christ in them and the... And the uh, evil spirit is outside of them. You see, once they believe upon Christ and accept Him with all their heart, body, mind, and soul, they're not a child of Satan. They're a child of God by adoption through He that paid the price. George from Chicago. It seems like I'm under a curse. Wherever I take one step forward, it seems I get knocked two steps back. Is this the devil? Or could it be God in trying to tell me I'm doing something wrong? Well, you have to discern that, uh, George, and I hope that after these two lectures on discernment that you're able to. Um, many times we just don't use our heads like we really should and figure things out. Use the wisdom of God. Study the book of Ecclesiastes and see if it won't help you gain control. Uh, analyze, what, have, what are you doing for God? Have you done anything to him that he would bless you, that he gets some of these rocks out of your road so you don't take the two steps back? If you haven't, it'll probably always be that way for you. Catherine from Georgia. Define exactly what a 